Welcome to Hot Chips 27. Keynote 2. The Road to 5G. Hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is Benham Robert Milley um, from Qualcomm Research. I want to introduce our keynote speaker today. First of all, I should ask all of you to please turn off your drones, sorry, your mm -hmm. cell phone I mean. Uh, our speaker loves to play with drones a lot, and, but not for the conference. So no drones are allowed during this keynote. So it's my great Great pleasure to introduce Matt Grob. He is Executive Vice President and CTO of Qualcomm. He is responsible for oversight of coordination of research and development across the entire company and also development of the next generation wireless technology in Qualcomm. He joined Qualcomm in 1991. Sorry, He's con He contributed to a lot of high profile project early on in his career, including CDMA. And if I want to go through all the project and all his accomplishments, it's just going to be an ongoing list. So I'm just going to fast forward. In 1998, he was promoted to lead the comp company R&D System Engineering Group. And in 2006, he was promoted to lead Qualcomm Research. Um, he holds a master degree from Stanford University and a bachelor degree from Bradley University and has 70 patents. With that, please welcome the speaker, Matt Groff. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. Actually, um, truth is, I don't mind if you fly drones or, or have your phones go off. The more data you move through the air, the better. <clears throat> um, and in fact, uh, what I'm going to tell you about today is not actually hot chips. Actually, cool chips. There won't be any hot chips. They're very cool chips. A couple, uh, a couple years ago, I gave a talk at a, a sister conference to this, the Hot Interconnects, and the section that I was in was called Hot Air. So hopefully, uh, won't be too much of that. All right, I'm, I'm excited to tell you a lot about 5G, fifth generation of cellular. And uh, you know, I, it occurs to me that the biggest question I get about 5G is, what is 5G? as if it has an identity crisis and people don't understand what it's all about. So it's still early and there's a lot of things that are gonna be defined, but I'm gonna do my best to explain to you what it is, why we think it's exciting, and why it is exciting, and what's a little bit different about it. So in the past, if you look at the internet, uh, the internet was you know, your desktop PC, you would use it at home, it was not necessarily mobile. Big success, but didn't reach a billion users that way. And then we got to the mobile internet with portable devices and 3G, and we got to three or four billion users. And then in the future, and this is what we're gonna talk about with 5G, is it's gonna be a lot more of that, but all sorts of new categories of devices, new types of services, new things that are all gonna be connected at high speed and low cost. And that's what we're looking at. So in the past, the paradigm was human communication. I call you, 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 you email me, I send messages, but in the future it's going to be all kinds of devices, not just humans, machines, cars, medical devices. In the present and in the past, your device was an endpoint. The call would terminate there. In the future, the device is not the endpoint necessarily, it's no longer the edge, it might be an edgeless situation where your device can relay to other devices and we'll talk about peer-to-peer -peer modes. <clears throat> Today, there's best effort data service. We categorize it by the speed. Oh, I got 10 megabit service. I got five megabit service. But there's gonna be new types of quality that you can request, not just QoS for throughput, but also for latency, for reliability, fault tolerance, fail safe, different types of link budgets, different spectrum paradigms. So we'll talk about those. And also today, there's disparate networks 
There's nothing works for licensed spectrum, unlicensed spectrum, different flavors of cellular, and we hope at least to unify those. Now, I know that's been a hope in the past. There's a good chance that some of that will actually happen this time. About every 10 years, mobile takes a big step forward. So the first ones were pretty obvious and easy to explain. You know, we didn't even call 2G, 2G until really 3G came along. Then we kind of went back and called it 2G. And then uh, 1G was analog. So you had analog communication. The change from 1 to 2 was extremely profound from analog to digital. But it was still mostly voice and low-speed data and text. 2 to 3 was... Now I can do digital data, but much faster. I can connect to the internet. I can have mobile broadband. Okay, so that made sense. That's a big distinction between two and three. And then three to four was, okay, what does that mean? Well, it was different modulation. So 3G was a lot of CDMA. 4G is a lot of OFDMA. Also wider bands, more spectrum, and higher peak rates. So 4G was really the same as 3G, except that it was wider and faster. So is 5G then again, which is wider and faster of 4G? It is that, but it's much more than that. So with 5G, we're going to have new types of services that you can't offer today. And I'll explain exactly why that is. We're going to have new industries, particularly beyond phones, into machines, cars, medical devices, cities, those kinds of things. And it will be edgeless. So these are, these are beautiful slides. That uh, this kind of shows you all the different axes that one can improve upon. And the point of this is to depict the difference between what we've improved upon in the past and what we're trying to do now. So you can see things like deep coverage, very strong security. Security is paramount in all of this. Reliability, and I mean reliability in a couple different ways. There's coverage, like wherever you are, you're going to be in coverage with deep link budget. But also, if a, if a system failure occurs, you want redundancy so that you can continue to offer a certain kind of service. Low latency, we're going to talk about latencies under a millisecond, along with high speeds, extreme capacity, high peak rates. We're going to talk about very high density, so some methods to serve, like in a venue such as this, when there's a large number of users in a small area, how, do we going to, how are we going to accommodate that? Okay, let's start with the mission-critical services. Things like industrial automation, medical, Robotics, cars. Right now, ask yourself, can, what can you not do with your cellular service that you'd like to be able to do? Maybe medical devices. Now, already today you can wear you know, a, a monitor and you can count your steps and you can send that in and that works well with today's services. But what you can't do today is you can't do a real medical procedure like a surgery or a, or a, a physician who wants to attend or needs to attend a dialysis treatment or something like that. You can't do that over cellular today without changing it because it doesn't meet the reliability that's required by the regulator for that particular medical procedure. And so if you really want to use it, then you have to add extra layers of security, authentication, perhaps reliability. You have to add stuff. And what we want to do with 5G is make that an inherent bearer that you can request. So a small company can do a great thing because they don't have to concern themselves with reinventing a large part of the wireless stack. They'll be able to request those kinds of services right from the operator. Automotive, robotics, drones, they want to do real-time control at very low latency, again, with high reliability, fault tolerance, fail-safe. And we want to design those things in. So that's a set of axes that we're going to push forward with 5G. Another one is to scale down to tiny devices. So we want to enable the network to support very large numbers, large numbers in the total network, but also large numbers per sector or in a particular base station of intermittent users that send very small amounts of data that don't have a lot of overhead to get on and off the channel and can enable new services. Now we have that, you know, 2G does that, 3G does that. We don't want to, we want to do it with 5G so that you can have a single network that can cater to the high end and the low end and that single, Single piece of equipment, that single piece of spectrum can be used for all these purposes. Uh, smart homes, object tracking. We want to enable low complexity devices. So in a 4G right now, the standards require, doesn't require, but uh, includes over 40 bands. And that's a great thing for smartphones and high-end devices. It's not a great thing for very low cost uh, sensors. You want to be able to have a single band, potentially narrow, and be able to uh, have a very low cost radio for that. 
And we're going, to we're going to do the classic thing that everyone thinks of 5G is it's going to be higher speeds, higher peak rates. And we're going to achieve that uh, with some improvements in modulation and coding, although those are getting harder and harder to come by in terms of significant gains. But significant improvements in the amount of spectrum you can use, how you process wider channels, how you use higher bands, and how we can densify the network by reducing the re radius of the cells, having much smaller cells, much higher reuse of the spectrum, and therefore we can still get orders of magnitude more performance out of the wireless network. You know, I'm often asked, is there a Moore's law equivalent for, for cellular performance? Are we running out? Is it getting to limits? Well, if you just have two antennas separated by some space and you have a given amount of power and spectrum, we're getting pretty close to limits there. We can still do a little better. But in a wide area network with lots of antennas, lots of phones, mobility, we're nowhere close. We can still exploit reduction of cell radius, better handoff techniques, better coordinated MIMO and MIMO techniques. We got a long way to go. We can still get orders of magnitude more performance out of the network. So that's one thing I'm not really too worried about right now in this era. OK, so this gives you an example of some of the things that we're going to add. Now, you may have heard some of these before. You might say, well, I've heard of peer-to-peer. -peer. I've heard of device-to-device. -device. I've heard of mesh. Correct. But it hasn't been part of a cellular standard from the beginning. We have added peer-to-peer -to, -peer to 4G as it came after. We have added mesh. And, and I'm going to talk about those a little bit. With 5G, we want to put those things in from the beginning and have the architecture to inherently and natively support it. And that will, re that will result in a unified platform that can do the very low-end IoT-type devices, the mobile broadband, and then also service the machine, machine applications, the high reliability, the medical devices, all of those. And with something we call multi-connectivity, we'll bring in 4G and Wi-Fi and so forth. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. It's not really a 5G feature. It's more a recognition of the fact that the multi-mode control of our devices, the so-called channel management or connection management, is getting much more sophisticated, too. We, we're all kind of familiar with connection management because everyone has pretty much learned how to go in and turn on the airplane mode or turn the Wi-Fi on and off, or you turn it on when you go into a venue and you look for the password. That's connection management. It's very crude right now, but it's going to get much more sophisticated when we get to 5G. In terms of the radio itself, we envision it built on the same OFDM modulation that we have in 4G. Now, we're going to make some improvements. We're going to maybe scale it wider. There will be some adjustments and tweaks, but it's going to be built on that same core modulation. There's also the, the potential to use some, some non-orthogonal modulation for Internet of Things or small devices that want to all transmit at the same time on the uplink. Okay? So when I say orthogonal modulation, what I mean is when two devices transmit and they're on orthogonal channels, the receiver can completely separate them from each other. They don't interfere with each other. OK, this is really important. So far in the past, cellular family has been in licensed spectrum. So when you use Verizon, Sprint, AT&T, T-Mobile, or wherever, they've purchased the spectrum from either the previous owner or from the regulator. And they own it, and they can operate their system on that spectrum, and no one else can. And you can contrast that to unlicensed spectrum, which is where, for example, 802.11, Wi-Fi, actually also Bluetooth and other technologies, they use unlicensed spectrum. Anyone can use it. It's free. You don't have to buy it. Now, you, it's not unregulated. You still have to comply with power and emissions limits. But if you comply, then you're free to use it. So we have these two families. We have the cellular family. We have the unlicensed family. And they, they have certain properties to them. So in the past, cellular has always had a one-to-one -one pairing of a piece of radio spectrum and an operator. So you have one channel. There's one operator on that channel. Verizon has a channel. They use it. Sprint and AT&T don't use that same channel. There's a one-to-one -one pairing. Whereas on unlicensed, say Wi-Fi, which has heritage actually all the way back to 8023 and Ethernet, it's always been the case that different entities can share the same media. So if I'm, a, if I'm a restaurant owner, let's say I own a Starbucks or something, and I want to provide 
internet service to my subscribers, what do I do? I go, hmm, well, I have these two choices. I can put in cellular, I can put in Wi-Fi. If I put in cellular, oh, I'm gonna have to put, I'm gonna have to put in a box that works on AT&T's channels and Verizon's channels and Sprint's channels. And I'm gonna have to put in a bunch of stuff so that all my customers can use it. Or I can put in Wi-Fi and I only need to light up one channel and all the subscribers that come in will be able to use it because it's neutral host. It has that property of neutral host. Cellular does not have that property. But that's something we're trying to change. We are going to allow cellular to have that neutral host property too. So that family of technologies will now also be a candidate for these kinds of deployments. And we're doing that in 4G already. There's something you may read about, it's called LTU, LTE for unlicensed, we also call it Multifier. In 5G, it's gonna be there from the get-go. It's not gonna be put in you know, five years later, it's gonna be there from the beginning. The ability to operate in all these different regulatory paradigms. And we're also looking at different bands, all the way from below a gigahertz, which gives you great propagation, up to you know, a couple of gigahertz, which is where cellular is today, and then beyond up to the millimeter wave, 28 and 60 gigahertz. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Okay, so across different dimensions, the, mod the modern devices, the 5G devices, will still be able to use 4G, Wi-Fi, and connect with all these different legacy technologies. We do that already today. That's the connection management that I was talking about. It's getting more complex, but we're gonna be able to supply that. That's a very critical function. And why is that? That's because you need the network effect and you need to be able to talk to a bunch of other users on day one. So if you go back to 2G, when 2G was developed, it was a digital phone and it was not interoperable with analog equipment. So what good is it for you if you're the only one in the world that has a 2G phone? Well, fortunately, the network would translate it and you could call the, the legacy phone. So even if you were the only user, you were happy. If you go to 3G and 4G, if we add something like carrier aggregation, which means you can go much faster, even if you're the only one, you're still happy because you can get to the network and do your thing. So it's important that we support these multi-modes and be able to connect back to the legacy modes or not require the operator to deploy 5G everywhere all at once. They can deploy it as it, as it builds out. And that's what this is all about. Okay, so then what's the difference between what I've just described and 4G? Are we gonna not work on 4G? Now, we are envisioning that 5G is something that the standards process produces around the year 2020. And we, we envision it that way because we want it to be a big step forward, not just incremental improvements. Now, 4G is undergoing at this point incremental improvements. 4G, I like to think of it like the, uh, uh, the 4G is the Boeing 737. Okay, it's a, it's a workhorse. It's in use around the world by many operators. And by the way, they're still improving it. They're improving the wing, they're putting new engines, it's performance getting better and better. That's like 4G is today. Whereas 5G is like the 787. It's, uh, you know, if you start from a clean sheet of paper, you can do even better. And that's, that's what we see going on. Now, I don't wanna be like absolutely rigid about that 2020 date. That's what we expect the standards process to produce and we're part of it. But there are some dates that come before then where some operators have come and said, we'd like you to do this or do that. And we're gonna to talk to them about that. For example, in the 2018 timeframe, there's gonna be the Olympics in Korea. And they wanna do certain activities that have a 5G experience. There's Olympics in 2020 in Japan, same story. And in some cases, it has to spectrum and, and which bands, and the regulator will clear it for that purpose. So there will probably be some precursors that come just before that date. They won't be fully standards compliant, but the industry will get a chance to maybe roll out a service in a market or two and get a sense for what these high, latent, high bandwidth, low latency services are gonna actually feel like to users. Meanwhile, 4G is gonna keep marching on. It's got probably 10 more years to go at least. It's already getting to be almost 10 years old now from the original physical layer design. And we will be able to do things like use the 4G control channels to turn on the 5G traffic channels 
That's something we can introduce earlier before we get to 100% 5G. And the other thing is, just because we're working on this at Qualcomm all the time and there's these teams, every time the 5G team comes up with a new thing, the 4G team immediately says, we can do that too. So that is taking place. Same thing happened with 3G and 4G. 4G will be able to come close on some of these things, but starting from scratch, you can do better. I mentioned adding multicast and, and unlicensed spectrum right from the beginning. Another example is wider band support. In 4G, you've got 10 or 20 megahertz channels. If you want to occupy 80 megahertz, let's say, for example, you do that by aggregating multiple carriers together, which works fine. We support it. It's used. But the modem design ends up being more costly than if you had a single wider band modem. And so 5G will be like that. By the way, we're going to add that to 4G as well. But then it's still there with the legacy. So basically, 5G is going to be more of a clean sheet of paper, a little bit bigger step forward around 2020, plus or minus a couple of things. That's our vision for it. So back on LTE again, we're scaling it in two directions. And on the right of this slide uh, is the direction to the, to the ultra efficient for low end. You see these things like LTE cat zero or LTE dash M. This M means machine or CIOT, which means cellular internet of things. So these are all derivatives of today's 4G that, that have fewer bands, potentially a narrow, narrower bandwidth, so the cost can be lower. So you can have little sensors, devices that maybe last a couple years on a, on a single battery. We're moving that way from machine to machine. Meanwhile, on the left side of this chart, uh, we're adding this, what's called advanced CA. That stands for carrier aggregation. That means you can gobble up more chunks of spectrum at once and get very, very high peak rates, you know, gigabits and higher, and very low latencies. But it does come at a complexity cost of all this aggregation, and that's something we're going to improve uh, with 5G. OK, so there's uh, LTE broadcast. And I want to I spend a little bit of time talking about this, too. Because another paradigm that we've had since the beginning of cellular, if you think about 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, what's in common with all of them from a topology standpoint is they are a phone and a base station, and they connect, and you get some data, and that's how it works. A phone is not talking to another phone, except through the network. It's not doing it directly. And the network is talking to one phone at a time. It's a unicast. And that's fine for lots of stuff, like phone calls. It's fine for email. It's fine for lots of stuff. But it's not good when you have a large amount of data that you want to send to a large number of people. And when do you have that situation? You have that when there's live events. You have that when there's popular pieces of content, movies that are released, and a lot of a reasonable fraction, you know, the user base wants to consume it. You have that when there's upgrades of application or op applications or operating systems. In particular, when new versions of iOS come out, there's a huge spike in load. So we introduce broadcast into cellular. And we've done this in LTE. And what that means is at certain points in time, at a certain point in time, on a certain frequency, on a certain channel, the downlink of the network is set aside for a multicast packet. And all the users can receive that same packet. And so that's coordinated across all the base stations of all the, all the region that you're doing this in. And if you do that, you can have a situation where the, each additional user does not impart more load on the network. Just like watching TV or listening to the radio, additional listener does not impart any more load. So why is this good? And how good is it? Well, for things like upload or download of new applications or operating systems or live events, it's incredibly good. In fact, um, it turns out you only need one or two users or three users per sector for this method to win over the unicast method. And that might sound hard to believe, but let me explain. Think of a network, like a city network, with base stations all over it. And each base station has you know, three sectors, and so you may have several hundred or hundreds of sectors. 
And, it, and then there's users sprinkled all over that, just like there are in this auditorium. If there are more than, say, two or three users per sector average over that whole network, then you will win by turning on the multicast channel. And that's because it's coming out of all the base stations. The receivers can combine the energy, so the transmission from a nearby station is not interference. It's not in the denominator. It's in the numerator. And you can combine it. So the cell edge performance is very, very high. So you can use a very high rate. And you can have an infinite number of listeners. And from an operator standpoint, you can turn that on uh, both spatially and temporally whenever you want. So you might turn it on off-peak in the night because iOS has a new update or there's a new movie that you want to push out. You can push out the media content, but you don't have to push out the security credentials. You can push it out, and then when the user wants to purchase it, maybe two days later, it's instantly there. It's on their device. They don't have to pull it via unicast. And we're doing this. It's part of LTE. It's part of 4G. It was added later, so there's some suboptimalities with it. And, but it's getting deployed. It's, uh, it doesn't add any cost to the phones because it's just another mode of the modem. So there's no extra spectrum required. There's no extra towers. You're just reusing all the capability that's already there. The operator can turn it on. They can turn it off. They can decide how much of the spectrum they want to use for it. They can put a little bit. They can put a lot. They can, they can modulate that. And so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a real attractive thing. And uh, it's getting rolled out now, Verizon and Korea. And uh, there's a lot of interest in this. And we're going to put this in 5G from the beginning and be able to support it even at a higher level of efficiency. OK. So another paradigm or another topology that we didn't have from cellular days. If you, those of you can remember, I remember, uh, what was there before cellular? What, was, what did we all have in the 70s and maybe in the 80s a little bit? It was popular, it was consumer, it was in pop culture. Uh, millions of them were sold, portable device, CB radio. And what did you do with that? Well, that was peer-to-peer -peer communication. And you could set up a quick net, and you had a commonly agreed upon channel, which was channel 9, and you could do something like warn everyone that there was a speed trap or something like that. And that got really popular. But then cellular came and kind of displaced that. And why? Because now with cellular, it at least seemed to be private, and I could communicate over a much longer distance. I could call the network. The network could go over the land and call someone far away and find them. Those were huge advantages, and so that kind of displaced everything else. For all this time, our devices lost the ability to talk directly to each other without infrastructure in between. Even in Wi-Fi, which has had ad hoc and infrastructure mode since the beginning, the infrastructure mode is kind of won out. The ad hoc mode is rarely used. Well, it turns out now, uh, as we get to the point where the LTE systems are more and more commonly around the world, time division duplex, that means they send and receive on the same channel, exactly, we can add a capability that gives the phone the ability to talk directly to another phone without adding a lot of cost. And we can schedule the resource in a manner similar to the way I explained for LTE broadcast. And so the operator can decide when to do it, how much spectrum to allocate. They can turn it up, they can turn it down, they can turn it on, they can turn it off. And now I've got this ability to, for my device to talk directly to your device. And why would I want that? Well, first of all, I might want to discover that you're there. That alone is a nice capability to have. I can do that today by uploading my, my uh, position and my profile to the cloud, and then everyone else does that. And then as long as I check it often enough, I can find that I'm a match, and it'll say, oh, your friend is nearby. In fact, Facebook has this feature. It's called Friends Nearby. That's great. However, if you actually get into the details and write down what you pay for that in terms of battery power, and how many people can do that, and how much capacity that uses, you will find that you could do hugely, hugely better. And with LTE Direct, what happens is the phone goes into a mode where it sends out a little blip that we call an expression. And it listens for expressions also, but only at a very specified moment in time. The same way that your phone listens for incoming calls 
Now, you might remember, you know, years ago, like maybe five years ago, we all had these phones that were clamshells. And by the way, they lasted for five days. You could actually go on a short trip and you didn't have to charge it up. Isn't that great? What happened? Why were they like that then and not now? Well, it turns out they were like that then because when they're receiving incoming pages, the system is synchronous. The phones are asleep most of the time. They wake up exactly at a specified time. That's the only time the network will contact them. They go back to sleep. By the way, modern phones still do that. It's just that we turn them on and use the bright displays all the time. If you were to turn off those features and just use your phone for voice and text, even a modern phone would still last five days. So that synchronous scheduled property, when you put that together with a direct peer-to-peer -peer communication, you get those incredible benefits. You basically can leave this on, this feature that I'm describing, you can leave it on all the time. And its battery consumption is on the order of what the standby time is on your phone, which is basically nothing in a 24-hour in period. It's only a sliver of your battery's capacity. So now you can have this like sixth sense, which is on all the time, and you can send out these little expressions, which you can customize to match any kind of a variety of profiles that you have and receive the same thing. The device can perform the matching of what you're looking for and what it sees. It can perform that matching at a very, very low level down into the, in the modem and not have to wake up the processor, so unless it matches. And that way you can be scanning continually. You can always look for stuff. Now, why is, why is this good? Well, there's all kinds of reasons. By the way, public safety is really excited about this because it, it provides a capability to find people when the infrastructure is down, like after, after a disaster. But there's all kinds of other services. Just to give you an example, um, let's say you're traveling and you want to find, uh, you know, maybe you're looking for something that you don't want people to know you're looking for. Maybe you want to find a liquor store. Well, you could use this and the matching of what you're looking for and what you're finding is done inside your device versus sending it out and having it done elsewhere. So it has this uh, more private, more secure kind of property to it. So we're, we're doing this. Uh, in this slide here, you can see, you know, we've depicted things that are local to you that you might want to find. Yoga classes, used bike for sale. There might be services that are hyper-local that are really close to you, and you can find them uh, with LTE Direct. Now, that's something we're adding to 4G. It's in the standards process right now. It's going pretty well, actually. It's, it's past some of the major hurdles. And, and Qualcomm and others are, are able to build it. We're going to support it in our products. Uh, but in 5G, it's going to go in right from the beginning. It's not an add-on, and we will be able to have even better performance with this. OK, so now I want to talk about different kinds of radio spectrum. So I mentioned the licensed and the unlicensed bands. And in the past, cellular has always been in the licensed spectrum only. But now we're looking at operating cellular family, in particular LTE, in the unlicensed bands. And so why would we do that? Well, in the past, you would buy Wi-Fi for your home or your business, you'd go to the store, you'd get it, you'd bring it home, you'd plug it in, and you'd pro it would provide coverage in your, in your home and it would work very well. And that's an excellent use case. You didn't need to get spectrum from the FCC, you didn't need to talk to an operator, and you got very good performance at a very low cost. And that's all been great and it's been a huge success. And by the way, I need to say this several times. We have a big business at Qualcomm in, in Wi-Fi, which we care very much about, and you know, we wanna keep that going forever. We're, working on 11AX and all the new stuff. But now what's happening is something interesting. You know, big wireless internet providers, such as the cable operators and others, in the US and around the world, are starting to stitch together those wireless, those Wi-Fi nodes. And this has been going on for a couple of years, actually. The notion that you can have a subscription, and when you're somewhere else, at some, you know, maybe at the neighbor's house, you can use theirs, or maybe you put a little box and it's open and passers-by can use it, and now you've got a wide area network. That's really cool. Now I've suddenly I've got a wide area network and a, a low-cost device like an iPod Touch or a device that's Wi-Fi only can get service you know, in a lot of places, schools, hotels, airports, a lot of places. Cool. So that's been happening. But again, if you now go into the details and you look at exactly what you get, what level of performance you get, how much it costs you to deploy it, 
And if you decide that you want to really make that a wide area network and you want and you care about things such as uniform performance across vendors with a more rigorous formality of specification, then the cellular family actually has a lot to offer. So the cellular modem is also has a little bit of a different economic incentive. The, the operator's network with their huge investment in infrastructure and spectrum, they tend, they can justify going to more extremes on, to get the more performance out of the modem than the, some of the consumer products we can really justify. So when you look at a cell phone, if you, if you take a, a cell phone and you, and you look at the chip inside, you'll see the silicon for the, for the cellular modem is larger. There's more stuff in there. Now, on, you know, on phones like this one, and most of your smartphones, there's cellular modem in there, there's a Wi-Fi modem in there, there's the radio, the, the RF chips for the cellular bands, and can be more than you know, a dozen, and there's the same thing, the RF chips for the Wi-Fi bands. So modifying it such that the cellular mode can use the unlicensed spectrum is not a huge deal, it's actually a modest effort. Even today, it's a modest, modest effort, and in the future, it will become almost nothing because really the, the hardware is there, and it's more of a question of plumbing them in the right way. So when you do this, you end up with LTE that can run in the unlicensed spectrum, and it can do it in several ways. One way, a real easy way, is it starts off with a licensed anchor channel like you have now on the licensed spectrum, and then it puts supplemental channels on the unlicensed spectrum. That's very easy to implement, and it's very efficient. We're also introducing LTE versions, which we call Multifier, M-U-L-T-E, that can run completely on unlicensed spectrum with no licensed anchor. And so why do this? Again, you're bringing the cellular family and higher performance. At this moment in time, you can get two to three times more performance measured in throughput per unit area, and so that can lower the cost of a deployment, especially considering, depending on the device, it doesn't really add much cost to the device. So you can, you can get these benefits, an operator can get access to a lot more spectrum. So those are the reasons to do it. Now some of you may be thinking, oh my gosh, there's lots of reasons to not do this. Don't do this, please, because you will damage the Wi-Fi. And that's why I really wanna explain and take this opportunity. Again, we care a lot about that. We have a multi-billion dollar business there. And this is not just regular cellular. It's very much been modified and changed so that it can have a very high level of coexistence with any other technology that's using that band. And what I mean by coexistence is I mean I comply, that we comply with the listen before talk, sense and avoid, philosophy and, in, and implementation that's already present in those bands. So what you see here is, uh, you know, we, we show this, um, let's see if I can grab this pointer here. In this case, if you go to, uh, if you look at an operator, operator A with Wi-Fi, operator B with LTE, when they started off, two operators had, uh, both with Wi-Fi, they both got 1x. If I switch one operator into an LTE operator, they will get twice the throughput. But guess what? The Wi-Fi guy will actually benefit too. And I will explain to you why that is. The, re the reason is it's pretty simple to understand. Let's say we were all in this room using wireless technology to pull data from somewhere, and we were all on the same channel. We were all contending for the same resource. And I came in and I, and I grabbed a few of you and I gave you a higher efficiency or higher performance modem. What would happen? Well, the folks that got the higher efficiency modem would benefit, they would get better performance. But guess what, everyone will benefit. Because for any finite amount of data, the fact that the fast ones get done sooner slightly helps everyone else too. Everyone benefits at least a little bit, no one is harmed. <clears throat> and this is a test here, this is a picture of the test, test chamber we have. You can see all the antennas there. We made an extreme case where we put uh, a whole bunch of access points close together and we measured the performance. And you can see the, um, the dark purple stuff there is the average performance of all the Wi-Fi users. 
Okay, so let me explain this. These are four different tests. That purple blob stuff is the average performance of all the Wi-Fi users. There were, I think, uh, eight in this test. So in this first blob, there's seven Wi-Fi users plus one more Wi-Fi user. This is the one under test. So eight Wi-Fi users, that's what they got. We then switched that one user to an LTE user, and that's what the Wi-Fi users got. Then we switched two of them, and that's what they got. And then we switched four of them, and that's what we got. And you can see that it's generally higher. In fact, um, you can go all the way to where there's only one Wi-Fi user completely surrounded by the LTE users, and even that one Wi-Fi user does a lot better than they did in the first case. So this is really important because new spectrum paradigms are part of 5G. <clears throat> it's not gonna just be licensed and unlicensed. There's all kinds of stuff in between. There's 3.5 gigahertz. There's bands that have <clears throat> a military incumbent or a government incumbent that owns the spectrum but rarely uses it, and you need to yield to them when they do, but the rest of the time you're free to use it. We want to introduce neutral hosts, like I was describing earlier with the Starbucks example, so that different operators can share the same piece of physical spectrum, and they will need to contend. And so there's going to be all these different paradigms. And so what you're seeing here is a, really a precursor of 5G, where we're just talking about these two particular bands. In this case, the uh, Wi-Fi band on this particular test was the 5 gigahertz band. Okay, so then Multifier, I mentioned this earlier. Multifier is LTE, completely an unlicensed spectrum. No licensed anchor, and it's not vanilla LTE. It's been modified to do the listen before talk. It actually sends out uh, <coughs> channel beacons in the, in the Wi-Fi format, the same way a Wi-Fi access point does, so that you can recognize, you know, other stations can recognize it. And, and back off as needed. And uh, we're really excited about this because we can get uh, two, to, two to four X more performance. And it's very powerful in terms of the traditional cellular things like guaranteeing performance across vendors and mobility, handoff while you're moving, uh, those kinds of things. <clears throat> now what's gonna happen is, is convergence, okay? I can tell you this firsthand, you know, back at the, in the Qualcomm Research Building, we have a big team working on the Wi-Fi, 11AX and so forth. We're working on this. Some of the guys are the same guys. By the way, a lot of them actually get along very well. And the reasons why one is better than the other are not secrets. And so we're, we're seeing a convergence process. And in the future, uh, when, you, when you look at the silicon, you're not gonna see this big block and this other block. You're gonna see a common block maybe with some hardware accelerators that are a little bit unique, and there'll be a bunch of ports, and they can come up in either kind of mode, depending on the spectrum paradigm in whatever region you're in. And that's uh, what we think the future is. And 5G, so 4G was the last standard that was at least initially defined only for licensed spectrum. Starting with 5G and on, um, they, will, they will include all these different uh, spectrum paradigms. So that's Multifier. Okay, I think I just kind of said this. Um, licensed, unlicensed, LTE, 802.11, and combined in, in a variety of ways. There's all kinds of ways to mix and match these. I mentioned the connection management. You can have LTE and licensed and unlicensed. You can have LTE and licensed Wi-Fi and unlicensed. You can have the physical layers, licensed and unlicensed Wi-Fi with the uh, second layer two and up coming from LTE, there's all kinds of different ways to mix and match these things. Um, if you want the most performance, you go all the way down to the physical layer. Uh, if you want a, a simpler or nearer term implementation, you can bond a little bit higher. You're already seeing that on, on products today. There's things like multipath TCP. Uh, there's things like Wi-Fi, LTE, RLC integration that bond them a little bit higher level. level simpler to do, performance penalty a little bit, but those are, all those things are definitely happening. Okay, so we talk about the, the, new, uh, the new connection paradigm, 
um, this is kind of what I've been getting at all along, is that we want to go to beyond smartphones. We still have smartphones. Uh, you know, there's still a couple billion people that would like to have a smartphone, and we want to provide that. And, but we're going to work a lot on Internet of Things. If you, if you take this phone and you open it up, the, the actual phone part of the phone is really only about this big. Most of this is the battery and the display, and the actual phone module is this little thing. And so we got this little thing that can, that can have, you know, essentially a supercomputer in it, DSPs, GPUs, CPUs, multiple of them, heterogeneous with all kinds of new structures and proposals to combine them in interesting ways. And then you've got all these radios with all these bands. You've got cameras. I mean, this has, this is a, phone that has a back camera and a front camera, like most do. It also has an uh, ambient light sensor, which we're also working on improving that in some interesting ways. It's got all kinds of gyros and all of that stuff. At, if you look at what we call the value tier, like a mid-range smartphone, is really just extremely, it costs like as much as a, as a pizza, you know, from a cost standpoint. So that means you can take that incredible result of the industry and put it into all kinds of stuff that isn't just phones, but that leverages what phones did. And that means things, smart things, uh, drones. So, you know, I'd love to talk maybe some other time can tell you that what we're doing there. Those are very similar to smartphones. They need position location, they need connectivity, and uh, it, it applies. There's all kinds of smart products for your home, thermostats and monitors and sensors and, and transportation devices. So we're trying to expand LTE Advanced to, to cover those, and introduce multiple hops. I mentioned LTE Direct, new clashes of services like the Mission Critical, and new paradigms where we combine all these different modes. Okay, I think I'm coming about to the end. Um, this is a little bit of a corporate slide. We care a lot about the evolution of wireless technology, and we invest a lot uh, in this each year. Um, since the company started, which, by the way, is 30 years now, this uh, past month, uh, the cumulative R&D investments have been uh, 30, over $36 billion. So there's uh, 4 or $5 billion per year. I know the exact figure. It's in our annual report. But you can see what, you know, the evolution. We started with going from analog to digital, digitizing, and then going from the desktop to mobile, and now we're into transforming basically the edge of the Internet and all the different things we can do. Okay, I think that's the last slide. Yes, it is. Thank you very much, and I would love to take any questions that you have. Thank you. Okay, time for questions. Please mention your name and affiliation before asking the questions. Don't be shy, or comments. or a request for new features. <laughs> Hi, Nathan Brookwood, Insight 64. One of the things that bothers me or worries me about the combination of the LTE unlicensed and licensed spectrum is that today it's pretty clear to me as a user when I'm using licensed spectrum and have to, which is charged for on some, typically by the byte or has a capacity limit per month or whatever, versus unlicensed spectrum Wi-Fi, where basically it's free. And as you start to merge these, I worry that uh, the carriers who certainly deserve to get a return on investment on licensed spectrum are gonna start charging me for my use of unlicensed spectrum. And should I be worried about that? And is there anything that the industry is doing to make sure that doesn't happen? Thank you. That's a great question. And it is something I would, you know, I think it's a good question. And you should, I don't know if I'd worry about it, but I would think about it. The, uh, the situation is already upon us. Okay. Even today, major operators in the U.S. offload their network to Wi-Fi. And they have decided, for the most part, that right now, when you are close to one of their access points and you're on their Wi-Fi mode, that it doesn't come off your plan. But they could change that. And 
that would be, that's independent of whether they use 802.11 family or 3GPP family for the physical modem, that's independent of that. Now, we've thought about uh, the confusion that results from this, and when you look at your phone, um, this is an unsolved thing, you see like the little bars, that's the cellular strength, and the little concentric circle things, that's the unlicensed band strength. And so which one is gonna be used when you're in these modes? Honestly, I don't know right now. It also depends on who the operator is. The, the, if it's the operator that has licensed spectrum and they're just using it for offload, perhaps it will be similar to their current pricing plans. And if it's an unlicensed operator, like say a cable company that doesn't hold licensed spectrum, their offering might be consistent with the way they do pricing plans now. But I don't think there's a final closure on that. I think it's a great question. I think it's kind of an in-progress uh, question. By the way, one of the reasons that I worry about it is I believe with AT&T and their deployment of those femto cells, they call them micro cells, that they do charge me for the data and voice that goes over the, the, my Wi-Fi network uh, and landlines uh, back to their network. So, yeah, I think in the case where it's a femto or microcell using license spectrum and your phone's in the cellular mode, then depending on the operator that could come on your plan, some of them have incentivized it because they want you to put the stations in your home. So, you know, I really don't know what's going to end up there. Um, hopefully we'll have a lot of competition and there'll be some of those forces at play. Uh, I'll let somebody else ask. Next question, okay. please. Hi, uh, Donald Forbes for Two Signals. Um, I, I work on uh, spectrum stuff and, and other things. Uh, so uh, the question here is um, how we do identity management. You did absolutely no reference to it anywhere through the entire presentation. And I'm concerned as to why. It, it's an open question. We, we can cover ramifications. I believe it leads into routing and the question of how operators understand who it is that's actually putting traffic on their network at all, if ever. And it's quite that fundamental. I, I want to make sure I understand. Right. The, the management of the traffic? Well, the, the issue is who owns the traffic. Oh, who owns the traffic? Yes. Currently, it's the network operators. Yes, currently. So I guess in, in the, you know, whether you're using LTE or Wi-Fi, presumably there's an operator, and they're either paying them you're a subscriber or they're giving it to you for free. Those paradigms are the same. Well... Yes, except that the unlicensed spectrum doesn't actually put a premium on the use of the spectrum itself. So you get competition in spectrum between users with no regulation at all. Um, I, it's, there's not, it's not the case that there's no regulation. No, I, I mean, between the, the, the you, you've got two people running Wi-Fi. You've got two people spectrum. running Wi-Fi. Yeah. And they have to comply with the regulation, which means they have yeah, to yeah. do the power and emissions and so on. And then from that point, they contend. And yes, right. that's exactly the point. Correct, and that's the way it is in those bands. We're not, we're not going to change no, that. No. But that wasn't where I was trying to go to. Oh. And the question is, when I do my um, telephone traffic through the Wi-Fi in, let's say, my local cafe, in which I actually set up the ah. as it goes on, um, and I, I talk to, uh, let's say, somebody on BT or whatever in the UK or AT&T in the States or whatever, uh, that traffic goes cross-network in these terms. It goes from Wi-Fi to... Right. Um, some telephone network. Correct. Now, if I were to tunnel through any of those networks, they lose control completely once and very permanently. And that's the issue that I'm concerned about here, is, is how the business of managing identity is actually taken across the network boundaries. It, it's an open question for the industry. Yeah, it's not I meant to be a prejudiced thing here at all. No, no, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um... And I would agree. I mean, that's not something that I just address in this talk. That's a, whether you allow tunneling or over the top or the policies of neutrality are kind of separate to whether the physical layer modem is from one family or the other. And um, you, you see that already with, uh, with uh, you know, services from one operator being blocked on another. And, and uh, it, I don't mean to minimize it. That's a very serious issue. It's, but, it's, but I would argue it's a different one from what type of radio technology that, that you choose. Okay, next question, please. Oh, Rick Merritt from EE Times. Um, 
just want to be clear, I'm not asking you about any unannounced products, but okay. because you have such a, a, a wide and deep view of 5G and the big changes it's going to potentially make, I'm wondering, besides any unannounced products for this audience of chip developers, what you might think some interesting 5G silicon opportunities might be, perhaps ones that Qualcomm is not going to do, but would still be interesting. Well, uh, we haven't announced 5G products, that's true. Uh, we still think it's around the 2020 time frame, so it would come in its normal course. I can tell you we're working on it with a very large team. And we will pursue many of the avenues. Uh, we're going to pursue traditional smartphones, tablets. Uh, we're also going to pursue silicon opportunities in the network on the small cells. But there's a whole category of machines, medical devices, and Qualcomm will cover a lot of them, but we won't claim to cover everything. There's a lot of great competitors out there in industry that are going to also participate in this. Uh, one of the major operators told me uh, recently that they now believe there are 1,000 companies working on 5G and that it will be a more open, more crowdsourced type of environment. So there'll be uh, a lot of opportunities, not just at the silicon, but all the way up and down the stack for security vendors, mobility solutions, uh, network control, as the previous asker was getting at. So I, th I think uh, we're going we're gonna to have an important role to play with it at Qualcomm, but there's going to be a whole industry behind this. I believe we have time for maybe two more questions. Uh, Hey, Matt, thanks for the talk. Uh, Matt Ramsey, Canaccord Equity Research. Um, maybe you talked about getting through the standards bodies in 2020. Maybe you could talk about the constituencies of those standards bodies and how they're changing. Are you guys including people from the auto industry, people from Thread and IoT, like how, or is it just 3GPP as it was in the past? Thanks. Thanks, that's a great question. I think it's going to be more inclusive than ever. Certainly it is 3GPP. Uh, and when I talk about the timelines of release 15, 16, 17, I'm talking about 3GPP standards process. 3GPP itself is taking on uh, a lot more, you know, partners and, and members from other companies. But more than ever, we're doing exactly what you suggested. When we did 4G, we really didn't go around and talk to the auto vendors or the medical community or any of those things. We are totally doing that now. That is more important than ever. So. Uh, you know, our adjacent market business is, is going to be over a billion dollar business, I think, in the next year or so. Maybe it's there already. I, don't quote me on that. I, I don't know that number exactly. Um, but I can tell you firsthand, being part of it myself, we're getting requirements from the auto vendors. We're getting requirements from the vendors of uh, head-mounted displays, which is another exciting area, uh, medical devices, uh, robotics. Um, you, you can see uh, our support of, uh, in that field, uh, several, several industry groups. So um, I think it's pretty clear that one of the distinctions in this transition versus the previous is it's much more inclusive of, uh, of contributors and partners outside of the traditional phone OEMs. Yeah, next question, please. Hi, Charlie DeMergent from Semi-Accurate. Um, you talked about the peaceful coexistence of LTEU and Wi-Fi and how the hardware can cooperate. How much of that cooperation is dependent on the carriers playing nice? Because I can tell you, for one, I don't, think they would, uh, if the opportunity arises for profit versus playing nice, I know which side uh, would win. Yeah. Can, are there knobs they can turn to, you know, from playing nice to current behavior? Yes, that's a great question. And the answer is yes, there are knobs that an operator can turn. So, uh, by the way, those knobs are on, on any wireless technology. There's, there's LTE knobs, there's also 802.11 knobs. And, and when, we, uh, when we tested this, um, the first thing we did, by the way, a couple of years ago, we took unmodified LTE and turned it on in the band in our lab to see what would actually happen. We expected it to cause Wi-Fi to be completely quieted uh, because it has a continuous transmission. That was not the case. And we quickly learned that there was a huge variety and variance in how aggressive even the Wi-Fi implementations are. There's, there's a, quite a variety. So um, a major operator does have that influence. They can, they still have to comply with their regulation, okay? There's some knobs you can't turn. You're limited as to how much power. You're limited to your emissions onto the adjacent bands. And you, depending on the region, you have different requirements for listen before talk. So you, you do have some limitations, but even within that, you can be more aggressive or less aggressive. And uh, it may be that operators do that. Um, but, you know, at Qualcomm, at least, it's kind of interesting. 
In years past, if I wanted to do a test of a cellular product, I had to, get, I had to call the FCC and get uh, an experimental license and I could go do my test. Today, if I want to do that on an unlicensed band, I have to do the same thing, except instead of calling the FCC, we have to call our own IT manager. The venue owner is akin to the, to the spectrum regulator. And if I go in and turn on an access point in the middle of the campus, the alarms go off and they'll say, what are you doing? You gotta turn that off. You can go onto this channel, not that one. So the venue owner, in some cases, especially in the small dense cases, or on a campus environment, in some sense becomes like the spectrum authority and they can choose which channels they're gonna use for which things. And at five gigahertz, there's still a lot of channels. So the contingent scenarios, in some sense, may not happen that often in the first place. We'll see. Actually, it looks like we still have time, so I guess we could take Oh, we got some more time? Yeah. Okay. Hi, uh, John Delaney. I'm very much intrigued with your adaptive transmission strategy going from unicast to multicast. Okay. When do you expect LTE television to be bigger than broadcast television? Ah. Well, for mobile, I would say it's probably already happened. For residential, it has not happened. Um, but I think for mobile video, uh, it's already the case that uh, when I say mobile, I mean you're outside, moving around vehicles, city, not, not just sitting you know, still. Um, that's probably already where most of the video content is consumed versus traditional NTSC or ATSC television. I don't think that uh, what I described, LTE broadcast, is going to penetrate like residential home service until some more spectrum is freed up. Uh, the, broad, the television broadcasters have a lot of spectrum, and in some regions it's not fully occupied. You know, there's a lot of interest in making use of the white space, uh, but until that happens, I think uh, LTE will be most popular for mobile. Thank you. And the last question. Uh, David Gustafson, unemployed. Uh, I wonder if anybody's thinking about fixing cellular voice. I find that cellular voice is just barely usable. I mean, calls drop out, you can't hear some words, you have to ask them to repeat, and then the coverage is miserable. I drove back to the central part of the US, and even on the freeways, you couldn't count on getting decent coverage. And certainly when you're off of them, it was horrible. Is there anybody thinking about actually making it so you can talk on these things? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> I'm laughing a little bit. Um, of course, there's, there's that. And, and uh, what you described used to be the only reason we had the darn things, right, for, to talk. And we joked that the, the voice quality has gotten worse. But um, it's actually, if, if you do a call on a new uh, Volte device in the areas where they've turned on, when I say Volte, that means voice over LTE. And not because that's, not because LTE is any great magic, but along with that standard and the way they've deployed it, they've defined a new voice coder, an enhanced voice coder, which is, which is very, very good. And if you, if you uh, connect to another subscriber that's also on the network that has the other end of the very good voice coder, then it's incredibly good. A lot of times when you're using it in your car, if you're using a headset, you're limited to the the quality of you know, the audio components in the headset. We're not, no longer using phones with good ear seals like we used to use. You know, they used to be the big thing. Now it's a tiny little pinprick hole with a mic and there's noise and you're in an environment with noise. So those, all those things matter too. Um, so yes, people think about it. Uh, I wish they'd think about it more, I agree with you. Coverage is a different thing. Coverage is a function of link budget and how many base stations, and a lot of times, I know for a fact an operator will get complaints about coverage, and they want to put a base station there, but there's a zoning or some other reason that prevents them from doing so. It's not because they don't want to put it there. So coverage is a little bit different thing. Uh, but yes, people are working on that, and as a lot of people are trying to make it better. Good. Okay, let's thank the speaker one more time. And thank you.